Well, thank you uh, for joining us today, whether you're here in the room or online. You know, last Sunday, we had a guest speaker here with us, Pastor Jamie Stewart from Florida, um, shared a, a great word. He, he spoke from the book of Mark chapter 10 about Bartimaeus. Now, Bartimaeus was a blind man, and Bartimaeus had lost his vision. He had lost his identity, and there were so many different things that Bartimaeus had lost in his life. And despite all of those losses, Bartimaeus didn't lose his voice. And when Jesus came passing by Bartimaeus that day in Mark chapter 10, it tells us that Bartimaeus used his voice to call out, to cry out to Jesus, and to see uh, his vision and really his entire life restored. And as I sat here last Sunday morning, I'm embarrassed to admit to you, uh, but I actually felt really convicted. Because my life in comparison to Bartimaeus is really, really great. I have my vision, I have a job, I have a home, I'm not a beggar living on the street. And yet, oftentimes, I've used my voice not to call out to Jesus, not to praise him, but rather I've used my voice to complain. I've complained about my situation. I've complained about the issues that are, that are surrounding me. You know, in the last year and a half of the pandemic, it feels as if it has just been one issue after another. It feels like I've constantly been pivoting or coming up with a different plan. I mean, reopening our children's ministry here at the church for in-person gatherings, I think we're on like plan number six. Because it just seems like things are constantly changing. And I kind of came to a place where I was like, you know what? I'm done. I've reached, I've reached the limit. You know, no, no more issues. I've, I've had it. When I was, uh, I think this, uh, when I was in university, I think that was the first time I ever saw it. There's this quote that says this. They're going to put it on the screen for me. It says, I can only please one person a day. Today is not your day, and tomorrow doesn't look good either. That, in honesty, is how I have felt at times. You know, my kids have come to me with yet another, you know, they've gotten kicked out of their Zoom class and they need help getting back online or this has happened or that has happened. I'm like, you know, what? I'm done. That's it. Enough. Enough of this. I can't, I can't handle any more. And perhaps you've had those days where you have felt like you have reached your limit. Um, especially, you know, uh, during the pandemic. And some of the situations, they aren't earth shattering. Like, you know, a mom's of parents of preschoolers, you know, that whole like uh, trying to work from home remotely and try and entertain your three-year-old at the same time. Or, or maybe you've been the educator and you went to university and you went to teacher's college and everything you learned was learning for how to teach kids in person. And then a year and a half ago, that totally got thrown at the window. And now all of a sudden you're having to try and teach online. Or maybe it's students, you know, uh, you began university and you were, you know, for the first, you know, 12 years of your education, it was all in person. Now all of a sudden you're online and you're trying to absorb material and trying to keep up on all of the assignments. Or what about our frontline healthcare workers? I mean, all of the new protocol and processes, it just seems to be like one thing after another every week. There's a new mandate. There's a new update on how things need to be done. Or those of you who work in logistics or delivery, trying to figure out all of us are now online shopping and you're trying to get everything where it all needs to go. It just seems there just seems to be a never ending cycle of things that need our attention, things that need to be solved, problems that need to be addressed, just one thing after another. And as I was scrolling through social media this week, don't judge, the majority of you do that as well. Scrolling through social media, there was a quote that popped up on my feed. And it was by um, the former Secretary of State, Colin Powell, who passed away uh, recently. And it said this, it said, leadership is solving problems. The day soldiers stop bringing you their problems is the day you have stopped leading them. They have either lost confidence that you can help or concluded that you do not care. Either case is a failure in leadership. And today we're not going to specifically talk about leadership, but I think this quote is applicable to our lives. That God has placed each of us where he has placed us because God believes that you can make a difference. 
that in the situations that are being brought to your attention, whether it's a family situation, whether it's a work situation, some of you, your desk is piled sky high with just things that need your attention and to be resolved. But God has placed you there on assignment. And I know this because Jesus is the greatest problem solver, issue resolver that the world has ever seen or ever will see. You know, we look through uh, the time when Jesus was living here on earth, and many of his miracles really were not life and death situations. In fact, the very first miracle that Jesus performed recorded in Scripture is found in John chapter 2. And you may know the story. It's the story of when Jesus turned the water into wine. Jesus was at a wedding. His mother was there, probably other family members. It was a social occasion, and Jesus was there just enjoying the party along with everyone else, and then an issue happened. They ran out of wine. Now, in that culture, in those days, that was a huge faux pas, but it wasn't life or death. It would have been an embarrassment to the family to have run out of wine at the wedding, but in the grand scheme of eternity, really, did it Did it matter? And yet the situation is brought to Jesus by his mother. And when the situation is brought to Jesus, Jesus steps in and he performs a miracle. He takes plain, regular water and he turns it into the best wine. Because Jesus is a situation resolver, problem solver. And that is our mandate. And so as I sat here last week listening about using my voice, I thought, you know what? In my life, I have a choice, and you have a choice as well. If you're watching online, you need to know that you have a choice. Are you going to complain about the situation in which you find yourself? Are you going to be thankful that God has allowed you to be there to bring resolution? So why don't you turn to your neighbor, if you're online, and just say this. Turn to your neighbor and say, be thankful. See, every day we have to make choices to either be thankful or to complain. The reality is, is that to be thankful or to complain is a matter of perspective. It's how you see the situation, whether you choose to complain in the situation or whether you choose to be thankful because we know that God is in control in our lives. You know, it's interesting because another way to focus this is how we look at situations is that we could look at it as the glass half full or the glass half empty. How many of you have heard that before? See, when you look at a situation and the glass is half full, you look at the opportunity, you look at the positive side of things, you look at hope, you look at the ability to see the good even though it may be bad. If you're someone that sees the glass half empty all the time, it is you become a pessimist and you're negative and you never see the good. I don't know, does anyone in this place have a friend or a family member that just might be that pessimist and negative? person that just maybe drives you crazy just a little bit of the time? The reality is, is I have to be honest with you, all of us can see the glass half full or empty at times, some of us more than others. And the reality is, is that all of us are guilty of complaining. Let's be honest, we are. We can look at the simplest situation and complain about what, what, what hasn't happened and what does not happen. You know, and let me say this, you know, I'm the kind of person where if you mess with my food, I'm going to complain. I'm just being honest with you. And this is an area that God needs to help me with. So when I go to a place like McDonald's, not very often, and they don't fill the french fries like they do in the commercial, I get upset. Because I know I work hard for my money, and I know that, you know, that you have squeezed that box in order to fill it, to make it look full, and the moment that gets dropped in the bag when I grab it, when it's un... This is a trick that they do. I'm just telling you. And it's open. I paid for a medium fry, but I'm getting a small fry. Don't mess with my food. Now, instead of complaining, because my wife hates embarrassing her when we're out, you know, and instead of me saying, can you please fill my fries like the commercial? Amen. Excuse me. Would you just please, uh, please add a few extra? That's all I ask. I don't say anything else, but I've learned to not make a big deal out of a small thing when there's people in the world that don't have anything to eat. 
It's amazing that when it comes to perspective and looking at things, we sort of revolve and have this Jekyll and Hyde personality depending on what pleases and what doesn't please us. It, you, know, you know, maybe the worship team didn't sing the right worship song for you today. So on the inside, you're complaining that they didn't sing the right song that you like because you didn't feel the anointing. Well, anyways, that, that, that's a whole nother sermon in itself. You know, or, you know, or maybe you drove in and someone looked at you the wrong way. Or maybe you didn't like the color of their mask. Okay, whatever it, it might be, we can find the littlest thing to complain about anything. And today we want to focus on two passages that the Apostle Paul wrote that we really want to dive into. I really believe the Holy Spirit today wants to mess with us. You know, there are some people that you don't mess with you. Today is the day that we need to allow the Holy Spirit to mess with us because he wants to adjust our hearts and he wants to adjust our attitudes so that they line up to his uh, will so that we can please him. The first passage that I want us to draw attention to, I'm gonna give us two passages. I'm gonna break down one and then Pastor Kerry's gonna break down the next is this. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 16 and 18. If you turn into your Bible or if you turn it on, please do that. And it says this, always be joyful. Somebody say, always be joyful. Always be joyful. Verse 17, never stop praying. Somebody say, never stop praying. Never stop praying. You can do that at home as well. Just join us, all right? Be thankful. Be thankful. In all circumstances. In all circumstances. For this is God's will. For this is God's will. For you. For you. Turn to the person next to you and say, for you. For you. Who belong? belong to Christ Jesus. To Christ Jesus. The second passage is Philippians chapter 2 verse 14 to 16. It says, "Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like the bright lights in a world of full and crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life, then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. Let's let that sink in for just a moment. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter five. Always be joyful. What does it mean to be joyful? To be joyful means to praise God for the small things as well as the big things. It means facing the toughest days with optimism, half full. Not because you have control over everything, but because God has control over everything. Right. There are things in our life that we absolutely have no control over, but I have found myself at times, and I'm sure you have as well, complaining about things that you can't change. Complaining about, you know, bylaws and mask laws and whatever it, it might be the last year and a half, has been some of the most divisive, uh, you know, things that I've seen on social media or out in the news and people's opinions. It seems like no one has anything good to say. And even in the church. Let's just be honest. It's easy to complain. We got locked out. We can get restarted again. We have to do this. We have to do things differently. And there's great things that we've learned over the last year and a bit through the pandemic, but there have been good things. And I understand there has been extreme hardship for some people, and there have been some difficult things as well. But the Bible tells us here, it's very clear, always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances. The things that we, can, that we do not have control over, we still need to allow ourselves to be be joyful and not allow circumstances or the enemy to steal our joy. Now you might be saying, Pastor Jay, that's easy for you to, uh, you know, say this, but you got to understand, I'm telling you, this, this whole week has been a difficult week. The moment Pastor Jamie preached last week and the Holy Spirit was uh, putting things, uh, you know, just pressing his finger on my heart, I knew we were supposed to speak this. So guess what? All that, all this week, I've had different challenges in my life that God was saying, oh, you're going to complain? Even this morning, I put my head phones in, my, my, uh, my AirPod Pro, you know, to just worship and focus in. I go into the bathroom and start getting ready, clean my face, and one of them falls out of my ear and drops down the sink into the drain. Guess what my first response wanted to be? 
while the water is running because you know that when you panic in a moment, you don't think logical in that. So as I'm trying to fish it out with the water running, I'm realizing, oh no, this is only water resistant. It's not waterproof. This thing is gonna die. And then I start, Carrie, Carrie, help. This is literally happening in our house this morning. She comes and gets a coat hanger and the coat hanger's not working. I've turned off the water and then I'm saying, somebody get a knife, somebody get a knife. And then as you know, when you take a knife and dig it deep down into your sink, it is not just your earphone that you're gonna be pulling out. And then I'm trying to clean this thing and it's not working. And then it's making this, for those of you that, that are Apple fans, it's making this beep, beep. And I'm thinking like, oh no, there's wasted money gone down the drain. Literally, it's not working. And Pastor Carrie, remember what we're preaching today? I had worship music going on in my ear this morning. I was praising the Lord and then a little... It's insignificant, but a little something happened. God, why did you allow this in the middle of my worship time? Why did you allow that situation to happen while I was praying? We begin to complain. We need to be joyful in all things. It says pray, never stop praying. Or another version says pray without ceasing. Praying without ceasing means that we don't give up in prayer. We don't turn to prayer as a last resort or an alternative when everything else fails but it's our first line of defense. When worries and fear attack, we pray. When sickness hits our bodies, we pray. When it seems like life is chaotic and everything is not going right, we pray. We need to ensure that we make prayer our first line of defense and that we're not replacing God in doing other things and then going back to God at the end when other things don't work out. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances. Did you catch that? Be thankful in all circumstances. It didn't say be thankful for all circumstances. There are things that we face in life that are tragic and hurtful and sometimes even tear us apart. God is not saying that we get out there and just begin to rejoice that we've experienced tragedy and difficulty in our life. But what the apostle Paul is saying in that, be thankful, why? Because God is in control. God knows the numbers of our head. He cares about every area of our life and we can be thankful that he is still God. And I don't know how this is gonna work out and I don't know how this is gonna turn around, but God, you are still in control and I trust you. But this is the thing that I wanna highlight as well is this. In, verse, in the verse it says, be thankful in all circumstances for this is God's will for you. Many times as a pastor, we get people come and say, Pastor Jay, I'm praying for God's will in my life, for God's will for a mate, God's will for a job, God's will for this, God for that. Will you pray with me? Absolutely. We will always, our team, our leaders will always pray to believe God's will for you. But my first question will be, are you always joyful? Are you praying? Are you giving thanks in all circumstances? Because if you are not praying and doing those things, then my prayer may not have any effect for you. Because if you're not doing God's will, then how can I overthrow God's will that you're not obeying? So it's amazing because we could even get people up here on a Sunday and pray for deliverance and pray that God would turn a miracle around. And I've done this, I'm, I don't know about you, but I know I've done this. I've come for prayer at prayer time and asked God to intervene on a situation. And the moment I get back out into that parking lot going through those doors, I start to complain. Come on, the kids are a little bit too slow. We told them five minutes ago that we were leaving and they're still inside the church talking to their friends. I'm hungry and I just prayed for deliverance. Or I get a phone call and I start complaining. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Church, we're not trying to nail you and beat a dead horse today and put you up against the wall. We're trying to address attitudes that God desires to change in our hearts, perspectives to see God in the midst of it and thanking him that even though we can't see it, he is working. 
These are the commands that it is God's will for us to rejoice, pray, and give thanks in all circumstances. Do not miss the opportunity to abort God's blessing in your life when you don't do God's will. It's clear, this is, this is a command. This is not something that's just subject to your interpretation. It's you need to do this. We need to pray, always be joyful, never stop praying and be thankful in all circumstances for this is God's will. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is God's will. And in case that passage of scripture did not convince you that giving thanks, praying, and rejoicing in all things was important, flip back over to Philippians chapter 2. Now, Philippians 2 is one of my uh, favorite, least favorite chapters of the Bible. I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with Philippians 2 because the words that Paul writes in Philippians 2, there are some hard words. He begins Philippians 2 talking about how we need to have the same humility that Jesus had, who, even though he was God, did not consider equality with God, something to be grasped, but made himself of no reputation and became obedient, uh, even to the point of death on the cross. And so it starts out with us needing to walk in humility, and then he moves on into us needing having an attitude of thankfulness and not grumbling and complaining, because in verse 14 it says, do everything, not some things, not when I feel like it, but do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. You see, grumbling, whining, thanklessness are not just about the situation that we're complaining about. When we grumble, when we complain, when we whine, when we don't have thankfulness, we're actually grumbling, whining, complaining, and being unthankful to God. Because if God is, control, if God is in control of everything, then he knows the situation we're in, and so we're actually criticizing the God who allowed us to be in that situation. That's an ouch for me. Because it's one thing for me to grumble about the situation, to grumble about the problem, but to actually consider that I'm grumbling about God, that's dangerous territory that we begin to walk in. You see, the children of Israel grumbled about uh, their situation. They complained to God. In the book of Exodus, chapter, uh, Exodus, we read about how God rescued the Israelites. They were enslaved in Egypt. God sent Moses to take them out, to rescue them. And so the children of Israel, Israel, they stood on the shores of the Red Sea. They watched God part the Red Seas. They watched in the wilderness as God provided food for them. Every morning they woke up and there was manna on the ground for them to eat. And then they complained that the manna Anna wasn't enough, and so God sent the quail. They watched as God subdued their enemies, and miraculously, there were battles where the sun stood still. Like, like they saw God do exploits, and yet they still grumbled and complained. In Numbers chapter 11, 1 and 2, it says that they complained about their hardship, and God sent fire and destroyed some of them. In Numbers chapter 12, just a chapter later, in verse 1 to 12, we read about Miriam and Aaron. That was Moses' brother and sister. They complained about his leadership. Now, I was, as I was, I was contemplating that portion of scripture this week, you know, I thought, can you imagine if you and your siblings had to wander in the desert for 40 years together? Like, I love my brothers and my sister, and it's great to see them, but 40 years together in a desert not able to go anywhere. Some of you were locked up in your house with your family for the pandemic and you were like, get me out. Did anybody ever reach that moment where you're like, Do you know, I just, I know we're in lockdown, but I need out. January of this past year, minus 20 degrees, snowstorm happening and I am bundling myself up to go for a walk because I just needed to be alone. Well, this was, you know, Miriam and Aaron began to grumble about Moses' leadership and they were struck with leprosy. In Numbers chapter 21, verses four, 4 to 6, God sent poisonous snakes and many people were bitten. God takes grumbling and complaining seriously. He hates it. He does not like it at all. 
I mean, the scripture is clear, and yet we feel that in somehow it's okay, that it's okay if I just complain and grumble a little bit. And you may be thinking, well, that's just the Old Testament. It's now the New Testament. You know, Jesus came. It's a new covenant. There's grace and there's mercy. It doesn't, you know, it's no longer a big deal. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 10 and 11, it tells us, and don't grumble as some of them did. And then they were destroyed by the angel of death, referring to the Old Testament. These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. Those portions of scripture recorded in the Old Testament about what happened when people grumbled and complained, they were written to warn us. You know, it is good that we're living in a season of grace because if you were gonna be struck dead for complaining, I would no longer be here. That's, that's honesty. It's true. It's just so easy to slip into it. But those portions are, sent, are, are written to, to warn us and to remind us because as we grumble and complain, we stop God's blessing. We stop um, God from being able to move in our lives. In James chapter 5, verse 9, it says, Don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. We must ever be mindful that although there may not be a physical judgment on us for complaining, that God still sees it. It is still sin in our lives. If we haven't convinced you that complaining is wrong and that we need to be thankful, I went through uh, the Pauline epistles, and so those would be all the books in the New Testament that Paul wrote, and I could not find a single letter that Paul wrote Uh, in the Bible where he did not address this, where he did not address the need for us to be thankful in every situation, where he did not warn the church to not uh, complain and to grumble. And that tells me that, you know what? Complaining is something that is just human nature. It's something that is easy for us to slip in. And we need to be constantly on guard. We need to be constantly reminded. And so as much as I'm speaking this message, this message is for me today. Because I, I am as guilty as anyone of looking at the situations in which I find myself and complaining rather than being thankful. You know, part of the problem is, is we feel entitled. That's the issue. You know, it's interesting because they do all these different kinds of generational uh, you know, analysis. And, you know, they say about millennials and Gen Z, oh, they're just entitled. No, 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 no. We're all entitled. The human heart feels entitled to get its way. And that's why marriage takes work. That's why relationships take work. This is why family takes work. Can you imagine they wandered with that annoying uh, aunt or uncle or cousin for 40 years? Same people. Some of us can't even make it through a Thanksgiving dinner. Think about what you had to tell yourself before you went to that Thanksgiving dinner or or that family birthday party or that family function. Y'all had to get yourself pumped up for that. Just like, you know, you just like, I just got, you know, you know, some of you had to sit back and take some Neo Citrin or some, you know, know, just to like chill yourself out because you know that if that one family member gets on your nerve, it is over. But yet 40 years they spent with, that, with their families. The Bible tells us, as, you know, as Carrie mentioned, their shoes did not wear out. Can you imagine not being able to shop? <laughs> For 40 years. Some of you complained you couldn't go to the mall. That was me. I like shopping, I love deals. I gotta see it, gotta touch it, gotta feel it. Come on, somebody, help me out here. You know what I mean? As much as online shopping is convenient when you're only five foot three and a half, you gotta be very particular what you buy because it ain't gonna fit. Amen. Okay, thank you. I got some amens here, all right. <laughs> only certain stores that I can shop, only certain lines that, you know. It was easy to complain. 40 years, the Bible tells us that their shoes and their clothes did not wear out. But yet, they still complained. They had all the food that they could eat, but it was the same meal 
every single day. Manna from heaven. I don't know about you. I don't know what them people do back in those kitchens when they cook that food. That's why you got to pray over that food when it comes out of the kitchen. And I'm not here to gross anybody out. You, you, you. Anyways. Don't complain. Don't complain. I, I'm just saying, but they had God make breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Just saying. And yet they complained. What kind of master chef would complain about, what kind of person would complain about the master chef who would make their meals? God. But they did. They complained. And do you know something? It is so subtle. It gets in our hearts. So what do we need to do? What do we have to do as people? We want to leave you with some next steps today to help you walk this out. The first thing we need to do is we need to remember Somebody say, we need to remember. We need to remember. Deuteronomy 8, verse 2, chapter 8, verse 2 says this. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Remember how the Lord God led you through the wilderness for 40 years years. I have caught myself in situations say, Lord, I just don't know if I'm going to make it. I don't know if I'm going to get through it. And I might have only been through it for a week. And I'm not trying to minimize the pain and the hurt, the things that we experience, the weights of life that come upon us. But 40 years, we need to remember everything that God has done in our life. Mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons why we forget is because one of the things we don't do is write down when God blesses us because we miss God's blessing in our life so quickly because because I believe as believers, God blesses us so much, we miss the little things and the insignificant things that we just treat as normal and God goes, oh, you're just missing it. You're just missing the very fact that you got up this morning and you were able to breathe. We miss it. I was talking to uh, Colleen in the the first service and and I said to her today, I said, Colleen, how you doing today? She goes, I got up, I'm breathing. There's some people that didn't. The very fact that we have breath in our lungs, we take for granted. The very fact that we can move and, you know, uh, just move our feet or various parts of our body. A year ago, I broke my finger and I did significant damage to uh, my tendons and my cartilage here. And so they didn't cast me. And uh, I, I was experiencing some back and, and shoulder pain recently that I went to the physiotherapist. And I went to the physiotherapist and he said, so what's going on? So I told him, hey, last year I broke my finger. Just a little bit of you know, extra history. He goes, oh, now I know what your problem is. He takes my finger and he bends it. And I thought I was gonna jump off the table. What I didn't realize was I didn't have full flexibility and motion in my finger. I didn't know until a trained expert pressed on the right spot in order to resolve the root of a problem in my life. And he said, once I begin to work here, I'll be able to work up and fix everything else, but this is the root of it. But you know something? It hurt a whole lot. And then I went back the next week and it hurt a whole lot. And then he said, are you stretching it every day? Are you doing what I told you? I left you with some stretches and everything. Church, If I just come to church once a week and hear God's word, but I don't flex what I need to flex and practice what I need to practice every single day and do and not just listen, I'm not gonna have motion and flexibility in my spiritual life that I need to. And the reason why I believe one of the reasons that we experience hardship and hurt and maybe some of you have continued to wander in a wilderness in your life is that because you're not practicing what, you, what God has told us to do. You know, it was interesting in the first service, someone sent this to me and we're going to be wrapping up in just a moment. And they, they messaged this and I really, really love this. It said, when you complain, you remain. When you praise, you'll be raised. Raised out of ashes, we rise. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. You are higher than any other. When we complain, we remain. Folks, that, in that one line, that's powerful enough. Yeah. We need to remember. Somebody say we need to remember. The second step that we need uh, to do in our lives is do not despise where you are. 
In Psalm chapter 106, verses 24 and 26, it says this, Then they despised the pleasant land, having no faith in his promise. This is referring to the children of Israel. They murmured in their tents and did not obey the voice of the Lord. Therefore he raised his hand and swore to them that he would make them fall into the wilderness. We need to be at a place where there is thanksgiving in our heart that we do not despise where we are right now. You know, sometimes we're so busy looking towards the future and about where we're going that we begin to be very critical about the situation that we're currently in. And we actually begin to cross over. We begin to despise it. And some of you may be in very difficult situations. And so I'm not saying, as Jay said, you know, we don't give thanks to God for every situation, but in the situation, we're able to thank God. And so we need to embrace the season of life that we're in. I remember when my kids were little, we had moved to New Brunswick. Jay had started a new job and um, it was a, a management position. He was working really long hours. And so I was home alone with the kids. Um, it was long, long days. And I remember there were some days where it was everything for me to be able to get through the day. I remember I would go into the kitchen, I would set the timer uh, on the oven till when he was going to be home from work. And it would be like seven hours and 32 minutes. And I would just spend the day counting down. And, and I remember my mom saying this to me. She said, Carrie, just remember that the days are long, but the years are short. And that season that I had when my kids were little, it went by in a blink of an eye, even though in the moment it seemed really long. And now in hindsight, looking back, I'm like, there were moments that I missed because I was not embracing the season of life that I was in. And so I encourage you today, whatever season you find yourself in, maybe you're finding yourself in a season where uh, your kids have, you know, just moved out of the nest and you're in that empty nest phase and you're feeling a little bit lost about, you know, how do I spend my time? Lean into God and embrace that season because I believe that there are opportunities that God is going to provide you with to be a blessing to those around you. And so don't despise where you are right now. Don't be in such a hurry to get to the next thing that you miss out on who God has brought into your world that you can be a blessing to. So we need to remember and do not despise where you are. And the third thing we want to leave with you today is thanks releases the supernatural. Now, if we didn't say this earlier, if we were to title this message, it's the, it's the power of thanks. The power of thanks. In Acts chapter 16, verse 25 and verse 26, it says this, Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and other prisoners were listening. Suddenly there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. I don't have time to get into all the details in this passage, but what we do know in this passage, Paul and Silas were in the dungeon, in the lowest part of the dungeon, where when they were chained, it was in a very uncomfortable position. It was dark, probably a whole lot of mess down there as well, but somehow they found something that was absolutely crucial. They found the opportunity to pray and sing hymns to God, and I love how the Bible is very clear. It was midnight. It was in what we would describe as the darkest part of a moment in a person's life. They chose to praise. And I believe one of the reasons why Paul and Silas did that, because Paul, who was a Pharisee prior to following Jesus, he was, you know, understood the scriptures. He was one of the top students that were coming up. I believe he memorized and knew what David did. And I really felt that I needed to read this as I close. And I just want to invite the team to just come up and I want to share this run scripture. Paul knew the scriptures. Paul understood and looked at the life of David. And he saw that even though David went through great hardship, and even though Paul had experienced great hardship, he was betrayed, he was left, he was beaten, he was shipwrecked. Paul experienced many things. But he knew that in Psalm 136, David said, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His faithful, in His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who alone does mighty miracles. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who made the heavens so skillfully. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who placed the earth among the waters. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who made the heavenly lights. His, heavenly, uh, his faithful love endures forever. To, to the, 
the sun to rule the day. His faithful love endures forever. And the moon and the stars rule at night. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who killed the firstborn of Egypt. That's a whole nother conversation. His faithful love endures forever. He brought Israel out of Egypt. His faithful love endures forever. He acted with a strong head and powerful arm. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who parted the Red Sea. His faithful love endures forever. He led Israel safely through. His faithful love endures forever. Do I need to continue? Paul knew that there was a pattern of something that happens when you give thanks. Paul understood that in every situation, that's why it's recorded in Scripture, he knew that when you get in the darkest moment of your life, he knew that when situations come against you and you get wrapped up with overwhelming circumstances, he knew that if I do what David did, then maybe a miracle would release me from the problems that I am facing and going through. Amen. But check this as I wrap up. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns. Another version says praising God. And all the other prisoners were listening. Folks, the world is listening to the church argue about Mark of the Beast, not Mark of the Beast, all these things and argue and divide it. Where are we praising and singing hymns and praying? Suddenly there was a massive earthquake. And the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open. And the chains of every person fell, prisoner fell off. I believe the church would be more powerful than people that would experience more freedom outside the four walls of the church if we would just pray and praise more than complain. I do. So, check this out. Matthew 15. Jesus gives thanks and then feeds the 4,000 and then it multiplies. Jesus gave thanks before it multiplied. John chapter 6, Jesus feeds the 5,000 and gives thanks, and then 5,000 were fed. Jesus gave thanks before the bread was multiplied. John chapter 11, Jesus gave thanks before he raised Lazarus from the dead. Father, I thank you that you hear me. And then in Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 17, Jesus told 10 lepers to go to the priest before they were healed, and only one came back to give thanks. Church, I believe thanks releases the supernatural power of God. And if we will praise God, not after, but in before, in the middle, during it, all the way through, that we would see the miracle working power of God released in every situation. So it makes us wonder, what was Paul and Silas singing? I think maybe it went something like this. the moment to be in jail and praise from you are all things. but Paul got something to you are all things. you deserve the glory. he had seen God's track record throughout the years the generations you, you are worthy of it all why don't you stand with me and sing you are worthy of it all For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Come on, church. Why don't we worship him for a minute? You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all.
place I just thank you for those that are here and watching online father we determine to position our attitudes our perspectives our opinions our heart everything within us to say thank you and be grateful and show appreciation in every situation Lord we might question and we might even be angry at you and we may not even understand why we are where we are but today, God, we give you praise in amongst the circumstances that we are going through. And Lord, today, I just pray for people that are holding on to regret of things that decisions and choices they make in years past that they cannot change or even have no control over to this day, but yet have allowed the enemy to trap them in regret. I break that off people's lives now in Jesus' mighty name. I command every lie of the enemy. I command condemnation. I command every bondage and every chain of regret that has caused grief and for people to not move forward in what you have for them to be broken now in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to remember, not despise where we are, and to give you thanks, not because you release the supernatural power of God, but because you're just a good God. So today, God, thank you for those that are here that might not know you as their personal Lord and Savior. May today be the day where they say, I don't want religion. I just don't want to show up to church. I really want to understand what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus. It's so simple. It's just say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Forgive me of my sins, and I want to live every day for you, no longer for myself or anyone else. So help me to please you in everything I do. That's as simple as it takes. So Lord, we just thank you today for your goodness to us. We say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. I trust that the Word of God impacted your heart just the way it did mine. Remember, if you haven't subscribed yet, you can do that right now. And then tell a friend so they can join us and be online with us each week. If you'd like to help us be able to continue this ministry around the world, you can do so by clicking the link below. And I believe God's going to bless you as you bless many others. Have a great week. God bless you.